We'll start with the question of is, in theory, a UBI a good idea? And that means, in theory, for the moment, we can sort of remove the money question, even though I know um, Simon raises it, certainly in his video. Um, but um, if we start with the good, and um, Greg, I think you should have first shot. That's good that you're starting with the good. That's why I get to speak first, right? <laughs> I guess the kind of philosophical argument that's been made best is um, one by Philip von Paris, who sort of talks about this idea of maximum freedom. And for him, he doesn't just talk about negative liberties in terms of, you know, freedom from unwarranted interference on the part of the state, what we would consider intrusive, but also in terms of positive freedom, that people need freedom to, not just freedom from. Um, the idea of capabilities in SEN's work is a good example of that, right? That people need an economic floor and that UBI gives them that in order to maximise those kinds of freedoms. John, are you happy to argue for the four at the moment? <laughs> yes, you know, I'm, I'm still going to argue for the idea of UBI. I'm just going to, um, I guess, lean against nearly all of those reasons for it. <laughs> um, and, and this comes down to the idea of what, how generous you imagine the UBI being. So... Uh, if, if you imagine it as more generous, then a lot of those arguments get on the table. Uh, if you imagine it, as I do, as being less generous than the current New Start, then the argument for is a very different argument. Right? It's, it's not about the improving the quality of the life as the person living on it. So it's, this is a very different argument I'll be laying out now. Uh, and that is, it's my belief that the best cure for poverty uh, isn't a better welfare system, but a job. Uh, and the greatest virtue of the UBI, or the negative income tax, in my opinion, because it's not taken away, it decreases the effective marginal tax rate. It improves the incentive for people to continue to earn more. It, under, it, takes, it addresses what I consider to be the biggest problem of the current welfare system, which is high effective marginal tax rates, where when people go from earning 10 to 20 to 30 to 40,000, they're paying marginal tax rates of 60, 70, 80%, which is a great disincentive against getting the job. So the solution to that, in my mind, is that I want there to be more welfare for the working poor. I'd prefer less welfare for the non-working poor. That's, it makes me sound mean. It's not because I don't like them. It's because I think I want to help them get a job. Uh, and more welfare for the working poor. That does a couple of things. Firstly, by more welfare for the working poor, that's what lowers the effective marginal tax rate, increasing the incentive to get a job. And secondly, and bear with me before you shake your heads, if we're giving more welfare to the working poor, uh, that, in my mind, can justify a reduction in the minimum wage. If we reduce the minimum wage by 10%, someone on $40,000, the minimum wage at the moment, would go down to 36000 but then if we give them welfare, working poor welfare of five or 6000 they're better off. They're better off, but the minimum wage has gone down, and this is where we'd have to get into the esoteric details of the uh, elasticity, the minimum wage elasticity of labour demand. But we've got fairly good evidence that that's about negative 0.2 to negative 0.3 in Australia, which means a 10% cut in the minimum wage would be about three to 400,000 new jobs. So my argument for the UBI is that it creates 400,000 new jobs and creates the incentive for people to take it. Now we'll get onto the question of, is it a bad idea in theory? And at this point, uh, as we heard, Simon was unable to join us tonight, but um, he very kindly did record a, a video, uh, which actually has some big numbers in it uh, and also sets, sets the scene for the current state of the social welfare system that gives you some context to work with. So if we could switch to the video for a minute, thank you. Hi, I'm Simon Cowan, Research Director at the Centre for Independent Studies and author of UBI, Universal Basic Income is an Unbelievably Bad Idea. I know that tips my hand somewhat, but as I couldn't be here in person today because of COVID, I thought I'd give you some background, as neutrally as I can, on some of the issues that you're about to hear about tonight. The first point is that the federal government spends just over $500 billion a year, or at least they did before COVID. And of that money, $180 billion is spent on social security and welfare. When you add $80 billion on health and $40 billion on education, the total welfare state amounts to about 60% of federal government spending. Social security and welfare accounts for eight of the top 20 government spending programs. But it's important to understand that when we talk about welfare, we mean a lot more than just the dole. In fact, the dole is a relatively small portion of our welfare bill. When we look at the number of people on welfare too, 
those receiving job seeker payments are actually quite a small portion. By far the biggest portion are those in the age pension, nearly 2.5 million retirees, with 1.6 million of those on the full rate. By contrast, just 730,000 people are on Newstart, but there are also people on youth allowance and various parenting payments. If we break down the figures of those on Newstart a little bit more, we see that 20% of those on Newstart have been on Newstart for more than five years, around 160,000. But by contrast, 240,000 have been on the payment for less than a year. The average duration on Newstart is three years, but more than half people get off the payment within 12 months. The last point here, when we're talking about people who are in poverty and possibly in need of government support, are those who aren't working but might need some government support anyway. And there are two main categories there. The first is stay-at-home parents, and this is overwhelmingly women, and the second are students. So we see that more than a million people are the, over the age of 15 are students, most of those full-time, and nearly 1.8 million people are either in what is described as home duties or as caring for children. When you add another 150,000 in voluntary employment and 250,000 in caring roles, you see a significant number of people who are outside the workforce but are performing social duties that may be of value to society. Now some of these people are already eligible for income support, but others are not, either because of activity testing where Newstart and other payments are designed for people who are looking for work or because their family incomes are too high. Now there's another area that is important here when we talk about unemployment. It's not so much who is unemployed now but who may be unemployed in the future and one of the big moves towards UBI is actually being driven by those who are concerned that technology will render people not just unemployed but a significant portion of the workforce unemploy a bull. Studies predict that job losses from AI and automation could be as anywhere from 10% of the workforce through to 50%. Now, this is not a new problem, and historical evidence from the Industrial Revolution actually found that this was beneficial to workers in the long term. Rather than rendering them unemployable, it gave them better and higher paying jobs. So there's not a guarantee that technology will lock workers out of the workforce, but that threat is still there. The last concept that I want to raise in terms of welfare, unemployment and poverty is the idea of effective marginal tax rates. Now, this is the income that is lost by someone when they transition from unemployment benefits into paid work. It includes not just money that's now paid in tax on the new income, but also benefits that are lost as your income rises. For some categories, the effective marginal tax rate, the income lost from moving from unemployment to work, can be as high as 80 cents in the dollar. This creates a significant disincentive to joining the workforce and creates what's called a welfare trap. Now, typically this isn't actually the problem for low income earners, they actually can't afford not to work anyway. This is, however, a very significant disincentive for partnered women re-entering the workforce after having kids. Now, advocates for UBI think that UBI can solve these problems and many, many others. As you may have guessed, I'm a skeptic, but it's over to your panel to hear why they think that this is a good idea. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess that uh, sets it up for Gigi, who uh, <laughs> has some fairly strong views about why uh, a pure UBI or a UBI is not quite the right answer to solve some of those problems. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, we should, I don't know if we want to clap for Simon. Um, I was expecting a bit more of, uh, of the argument against UBI rather than the facts and figures, but of course the facts and figures are very useful to give a sense of perspective. And uh, I think one of the figures that Simon mentioned was this $180 billion that we currently spend on a variety of welfare programs, including the age pension and the New Start or job seeker, what we want to call it now. And those kinds of programs are often what are targeted for replacement by the universal basic income, by those who advocate for the universal basic income, saying the government's role should be to distribute evenly across the whole population their sort of um, dividend of being a member of society. But if you 
take the name universal basic income seriously, then you are saying not only is it universal, so to every man and woman in society, perhaps from the time they turn 21 or 18 or something, but it is also basic. So it is not, in fact, what John was describing, which is essentially very similar to what we have in the United States, the earned income tax credit, where you're essentially trying to promote the idea of work by giving extra benefits or subsidies to those who have a reasonably low wage, because then it becomes even more advantageous for those people who are maybe on the margin of working versus staying on the dole to go ahead and work. And that does not generate a, a, a basic income. A basic income would be at a minimum something like $20,000 a year. This is at a minimum. And if you simply multiply $20,000 a year times the number of adults in Australia, you come up with a figure that's a lot higher than $180 billion, something more like $380 billion. So argument one against the UBI from across the political spectrum has been the cost. If you are serious about a basic income for everyone, providing that straight off the bat, you're talking about a huge increase in the amount that we spend as a government towards social welfare, social insurance programs. And of course, then the argument is, well, what would the money be coming from? What are we, what are we spending on now that we wouldn't be spending on if we were to transition to a universal basic income? And then all manner of things might be on the chopping block. Education, uh, research and development supports, infrastructure, you name your category of preferred government expenditure that you would like to ax in order to fund this. Argument two is that compared to the sorts of programs we have now that Simon described and that probably many of you are familiar with, this would be, on the face of it, a regressive move. If you take the envelope that we currently use to distribute cash to those Australians who need it at times and places where they need it, and you instead distribute it equally across everyone from the person on the street to Gina Reinhardt, then you have made a regressive move. You have redistributed regressively. <laughs> away from the people who need it the most. And that's generally not something that, you know, a lot of people think is a good idea in an environment in which inequality has been rising and we do have the same, same concerns that were raised by Greg in relation to people who are struggling to make ends meet. Do you, in that situation, take money away from the people who are arguably the most needy by the various checks that we have in place to allocate money through our transfer systems and give it instead to people like me? I don't want a universal basic income, I don't need it. Right? So we shouldn't be giving it to me. So that's the second argument, is it's a regressive move. The third argument is about work incentives. And this goes back to a bit of what John was saying. Um, and the problem with you know, the argument really is that no matter what you do, you cannot get away from a basic unavoidable fact, which is if the government gives money to anybody at any point on the income distribution, eventually it has to claw it back because it's not affordable to give that same amount to every single person as per point one, right? So at some point, if we want to be generous on the negative end of the income distribution, we have to claw it back as people's incomes go up. And that's true as much as for the negative income tax as it is for you know, any other system, the earned income tax credit or anything else. And so the concern with UBI is in the same way that when we claw back money, we create a disincentive for people to earn more because it'll be that much more expensive, they're going into a higher tax bracket and they don't want to get there, so they're going to just shade their income, they're going to not work quite as much to try to get themselves on the right side of that budget set kink. You have the same problem at the very end where if you're just getting the money no matter what you do, then why does it matter whether you have a job? Right? And so this idea that it will disincentivize people from actually getting a job. And this leads into the probably, I think, the, the most compelling argument against a UBI which is that a universal basic income concept, although it may, may sound generous and progressive, it is expensive, regressive, and actually is throwing money at a problem whose causes are far, far deeper than a lack of money. The causes of poverty and the causes of disadvantage in this country have much more to do with big, broad, complex, messy problems related to human capital development, linking into the society, working out how to be confident in yourself and learn about yourself so that you can put yourself into the mix, figure out who you can trade with, who can supply your business, how to get a loan, any of these kinds of things that many people in the audience here will know you know, because they, they were educated in the home or they've gone through, they've had a lot of experience and they know, but just throwing money at someone who has none of that knowledge and none of that capacity to enter 
a labor market because they're just outside the loop so much, that's not going to help them in the long run. So what we really need to do is take the money, instead of throwing it at people in checks, we need to take the money and confront some of these very, very complex and multi-layered problems of disadvantage in the society. And that involves a lot of work. And it involves people having conversations, whether it's in indigenous communities or in you know, places where they're that are dealing with disadvantaged children, and working out what are these problems and how can we help these people. So I think it's not that there aren't any problems in society, it's that throwing money at those problems is not always the right answer. I think a lot of what you said there is a really good argument against what I'm going to call a big UBI. And I note that your argument against a small UBI basically amounted to, nah, it doesn't count as basic. <laughs> I'd be looking at something like a $1,000 a month. So something very similar to Andrew Yang, except in Australian dollars, $12,000 a year. That is less than New Start. Um, but I think, and you might say you don't like it because it's not generous enough, and you're certainly allowed to say that. Uh, but I don't think you're allowed to say it's not a universal basic income. Uh, it is. It might just be one that you don't like. And if you don't like that, then I think you'd have to give a reason against that, which I assume would be a reason against my lack of generosity, uh, to which I would rebut that I think a big part of the solution of solving poverty, two parts I'd, I'd give it to you. Um, one is jobs, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the other is individualized attention to the underlying problem of the person involved to which I would say community welfare is infinitely better at doing that than government welfare. And they're not complements, they're substitutes. Uh, and this goes to perhaps a bigger philosophical discussion that would take us well off, off base for this hour. Uh, but th that, that's, my, that's my response to, to that side of things. Going back to the jobs, I wanted to pick up on one thing you said that um, a negative income tax or a UBI, as I propose, still would have an effective marginal tax rate. Absolutely, it would. So the, the scheme the schema that I've roughly put together for Australia, $12,000 per year, or $1,000 a month, uh, would then be dragged back at 30%, 30% from the get-go, right? So abolishing the uh, tax-free threshold effectively and putting in a 30%. So it's true, it has a 30% disincentive to work. The current system has a 70%. 30 is less than 70. That is good. I readily admit that there's still an effective marginal tax rate. I don't think any proponent of UBI or NIT has doubted that. Uh, but if we could decrease the effective marginal tax rate, we increase the incentive to get a job. And if we're going back to my earlier argument, made more jobs available to low-skilled workers or low-productivity workers, more jobs would exist, the incentive to take it would be higher, and I think that would do more to address poverty than either keeping the current system or introducing a big UBI, in which case then I'm suddenly switching sides and taking Gigi's side. Just in terms of defining our terms, that if we're going to talk about welfare, we need to factor in tax expenditures because there's a whole lot of uh, welfare that goes through the tax system that doesn't go through the cash transfer system in terms of Centrelink, negative gearing, superannuation tax concessions, capital gains tax exemptions. And they're not going to pay for a generous UBI, but I think they're going to have to be part of a discussion around what tax reform and widening the tax base would need to look like. Plus, if we're going to give Gina Reinhardt the money, I mean, you depending on how you design it again, it can have net contributors and net beneficiaries, right? So Gina Reinhardt, if we can get the tax out of her, and don't forget 73, million, uh, 73 millionaires, as it said on the weekend, paid zero tax in Australia last week, but if we got Gina to pay her tax, we would, get, we would claw it back, right? And I'm less worried about the churn in the same way that Henderson was less worried about the churn in terms of paying and, and, rec and clawing back the tax, right, to some extent. So I think you have to do the tax reform, and we've not been very good at that in terms of this country of having a debate about tax. But the other thing I'd say is creeping into the discussion a little bit is that, yes, we need to address lots of underlying problems, and I've worked with employment services and you know, other forms of assistance that tries to address the skills issue and the human capital problem. But I also think it's a misrepresentation to think that the answer to poverty is reforming character. I mean, addressing poverty is actually a problem of cash in the first instance. It, it really is. I mean, I spent two weeks in Harvey Bay and Bundaberg speaking to people who are very good at managing their money, but now they're told 80% of their income is quarantined on a card and they'll have 20% cash to spend. So you talk to single mums who had savings accounts for their kids, a saving account for themselves, this is pre-cashless debit card trials, and now they've got no savings, they're in debt, they're paying a poverty premium on getting things like skips delivered because the Inju card doesn't work, plus we pay $10,000 per person for that trial. Like it's a complete waste of money, and all the evaluations have shown that to be the case. So we're throwing a lot of money at bad programs that don't address poverty. I would rather we worry about the underlying poverty in terms of the cash 
And then on top of that, we need the wraparound social services? Absolutely. 